Welcome to today's live lesson for AS English. Today, I would like us to um, look at, let me share my screen with you. I'd like us to look at the, at some, should I say, example candidate responses. Now it's really worth your while to get hold of this booklet. You can find it online. You just type in the words, uh, candidate responses, AS level English, even the code if you want, 9093, and you'll find this response booklet online. It's quite a big booklet. So um, over the next couple of weeks, we're gonna explore the different kinds of responses some candidates have given to certain questions that are going to be um, kinds of questions you'll have to answer. Passages questions, directed writing questions, um, creative writing questions, or imaginative writing, and writing for an audience kind of questions. And we'll look at, um, I'll try and look at the higher grades, maybe sometimes the lower grades or a medium grade that a candidate receives, um, just to give you a better idea of why they received the grade they received and how the examiner, what the examiner looks at and what you are um, judged on or marked on in terms of the content of your, for this work for today, your commentary on a passage. So let's, um, well, let me just put uh, the chat box up in case you want to say something as I'm going through the lesson. Okay. Right, so um, here we go. Now, for your exams for the AS English, you will be writing paper one passages and paper two writing. And for the passages, you get two hours and 15 minutes, and for writing, you get two hours. So you are always restricted to time, which is why we advise you write things out by hand, your assignments, so that you get used to writing things out by hand because that's what you're going to be doing in the exam. So paper one passages. Here is a question that a candidate was given. Let's have a look at how they respond to the passage in their commentary. And I'm only going to look at question 1A today. Okay. The following text is taken from an account of the writer's experience of extreme weather in Vietnam in Southeast Asia. Excuse me while I just get the pen up here. So let's just look at this one more time. The following text is taken from an account of the writer's experience of extreme weather in Vietnam in Southeast Asia. So what are we looking at? We're looking at the writer's experience of what? Extreme weather, where? Southeast Asia, Vietnam, okay? And A says, comment on the ways in which language and style, what a surprise, are used to convey the impact the impact of weather and people's reactions to it. So when you look at this passage, you want to focus on what is said and how it is said and how these relate specifically to the impact the weather has um, and how people react to it. Okay, so remember, you've always got to read your questions very, very carefully. And I would advise that once you've written your commentary, you go back and you read the question. And just keep in mind whether you, you think you've answered the question that they've given you in the paper because it's very easy to lose focus and to go off on a tangent. Okay. So let's have a look at this extract. Mornings in Vietnam in the rainy season. I must remember to push the mattress up on its side when I get up before doing anything else. If not, it becomes heavier and heavier with moisture, the pungent stink of mildew, a kind of mold, pinching my nose at night. In the rainy season, everything I do is a strategy for coping with the damp chill and the water. I didn't grow up here. The water infiltrates my consciousness. I learn to accept it like the others around me, to see it as a minor disruption. In the rainy season, I must remember to keep my showers to a few minutes, no matter how good it feels to have the water pounding my back, soothing away the chill. The water slowly seeps through the cement between the shower stall and bedroom, impregnates the wall and a sheen of tiny droplets over my bed. Another thing to remember, Never leave the pillows propped up against the wall. In the rainy season, 
I mustn't boil water for tea or cook anything that produces too much steam, adding to the weight of moisture hanging in the air. The excess humidity settles, a visible mist upon the clothes hanging in my closet, turning them into a new life form, furry and spotted. Every surface a wick for moisture. In the rainy season, I am thankful that my home is in this neighborhood, this alley, so much higher than the main road. While the rich sleep in their attics or on their roofs, the swirling muddy water laps at my door sill, but doesn't enter. I grab my umbrella and head out for breakfast. I push open the waterlogged left panel of my carved wooden door. My umbrella mushrooms out with a snap and a dull whump, displacing water-filled air. Rain sheets down from our red tiled roof. My nephew, radiant in his purple rain poncho, a canary yellow motorcycle helmet pushed down over the hood, stands under the eaves, rain rat-a-tat-tatting down from the roof onto the helmet. A duet with the drumming rain on my umbrella. Pausing a moment in the ankle-deep water, we listen to the call and response rhythm we make together. He laughs, a great Betty laugh, and roars off on his motorbike, the water a tall rooster tail behind him. Looking at the world from under my rose-colored umbrella, I wade down the alley with its gold walls, under gray skies and green leaves. The lane falls to meet the road. The water rises to my knees, threatens my jeans rolled up thigh high. Each step an eternity, pushing against the flow, my toes seeking the edge of the sidewalk. Stepping out into the main road triggers a memory from the year before. This corner is where the pavement dips into a pothole, where I twisted an ankle under the murky water. I can't see my feet or even my knees. The perfume river, not knowing its boundaries or refusing to have any, overflows the banks, invades the road, and climbs the steps of shops and homes. In the rainy season, instead of my usual coffee and soup on the bank of the river, I head for the very back of a restaurant I never set foot in during good weather. The tables near the front are prone to the fine mist that kicks up from the water skimmed entrance, pummeled by the onslaught of rain. I'm lucky to find an empty seat. Waiting for breakfast, I watch the river swelling over the road, up the three steps, and into the crowded restaurant. Inhaling the aroma of bitter coffee, I watch boys swimming and casting their fishing lines, shouting and laughing in the river that used to be the road. A group of teens cycle past, cycles past, four abreast, wearing purple and pink ponchos. Laughing, pushing at the pedals, they move in slow motion, tires submerged. One of them struggles but cannot avoid a branch drifting into his path. Across from the restaurant, several tourists raise their cameras to snap souvenirs of a small girl hugging her wiry dog on the roof of her home. Down the road, the water is higher. Another dog stands on the hood of a taxi, barking as, at the water as it rises, lapping over the hood. Awaiting my food, I peer through the breakfast bustle to watch the tourists point their cameras at the rising river and the falling rain. They laugh and curse and squeal as the water soaks their pant legs, rolled up to their crotches, giving them a bow-legged gait as they enter the restaurant in squelching shoes. After breakfast, I venture out of the shelter of the restaurant and back into the flood, the chill soaking into my bones. Bits of flotsam, a plastic water bottle, a piece of someone's front door, bob against me as I struggle against the current until I reach my alley. I wonder if this is the year the water will rise up my walls. Okay, so it's quite a long passage that is given for this particular um, exam. It's quite a long passage, although it's probably quite a normal length. 
um, sometimes hopefully they will give you um, some definitions of words, just in case you didn't know what they meant, but they will assume that you understand the rest of the words, okay? So that is why you should read widely so that you have good vocabulary, okay? Now, let's look at the example candidate response. And please just forgive me if I cannot always read a word out correctly. Um, the writing is quite difficult to decipher at times, so I might get one or two words wrong, but I'll just correct myself as we go along. Okay. So keep in mind that this candidate got a grade A. So this is a very high mark, right? Band one. This is band one, grade A. Okay, so let's see how they looked at, let's look at that question one more time. How did they look at the language and the style and how it conveys the impact of the weather and people's reactions to it? Okay, so I think I'm just going to try and make this a bit bigger, yeah. The purpose of the text is for the writer to express what has become a routine for him in dealing with the extreme weather in Vietnam, as well as the way other people are affected by it. Look at how this introductory sentence almost mimics the question, all the, or not just the question, all the information you're given about the text, that it's in Vietnam, that it's about extreme weather, um, how he deals with it, how it affects him, and how it affects other people. So just that opening sentence already introduces these thoughts and shows you what direction hopefully this candidate is going to take. They're going to focus on these ideas in particular. So he's looked at the purpose, um, this idea that it's become a routine and um, the focus is on extreme weather. This is shown by the repetition of the phrase in the rainy season, right away. This candidate is getting to grips with language. There's repetition. And what is the repetition of? The phrase. He knows it's a phrase. It's a phrase in the rainy season. Let's have a look. Is the candidate right? Well, yes. Look how many times I said in the rainy season. In the rainy season. In the rainy season. He doesn't do it every single time. Okay. It's not there every single time, but it forms the basis of this writer's experience of the storyline, right? So, this is shown by the repetition of the phrase in the rainy season at the beginning of several paragraphs before expressing all the chores and responsibilities the writer must do. Look at the quote marks, okay? They are quoting from the text. This is good. This is what markers want to see. Um, in the rainy season, everything I do is X, Y, Z. I must remember this. I mustn't do this. Um, and so there is this use of the word must as a root idea, and that would be accepted by the marker. So now he's going to explore possibly these chores and these responsibilities. This creates the effect. Oh, excellent. So here we've had a P, a Q, and a, now we're coming to the C part. The point that you make, the repetition of the phrase, the quote to support the point in the rainy season at the beginning of several paragraphs. And now we're going to comment on the effect this creates. And this is the third step that most students do not get to grip with. Okay. This is what your examiner wants to see. This is where analysis actually comes in. This creates the effect of a list of chores to be followed precisely due to the use of the verb must in order to cope with the weather suggesting a sense of routine all right so this is what the repetition does this is the effect it creates it's like a list i must do this i mustn't do that oh yes there's that and there's that so that listing effect that repetition suggests having to cope with the weather okay pointing out the effect that this extreme weather is having on the writer as well. So we like, all well, the marker will like the opening paragraph. And then the candidate continues. First of all, and then he goes on to explore an idea, we'll look at this now, but note that if you do first of all, you must at some point then do secondly or in addition, okay? Um, so because students forget to have that sense of continuity between paragraphs. First of all is this. Second of all is that. And then let's see how, how else they continue. As the writer, blah, blah, blah. Let me just see the next one. The writer concludes. Okay, so he methodically, the candidate methodically moves through the extract. Okay. Um, in a way that, the, that allows the marker to follow what is going on. 
So first of all, the writer uses several personifications, and that's fine, for water. So if you can identify a device that's used, mention it. Whether it's metaphors, similes, personifications, whatever it is, identify it. it uses several personifications for water. Muddy water laps at my door sill but doesn't enter. Now, if I were marking this in an assignment, I would want to see that you know how to incorporate quotes properly. I would want to see the colon here that indicates there's going to be some justification with a quote about this point. Use uses several personifications for water, yes. Well, what are they? Show me by using that colon. They are muddy water, etc. So here I would have put quote incorp is probably what you would see, quote ink. That means incorporating your quote properly into the sentence. Note that this examiner has not put any marks anywhere on this, um, on this piece of uh, writing. That is because you do not get your exam back once you have written your exam. You get your results, but you never get to see the exam. You get the examiner's comments. Is that right? I think it is right. Um, so so um, that is why they don't bother correcting you in any way, the way that I would in your assignments to try and improve your writing, because this is the final product that you are producing for the, for the course, for the exam. Okay. So, first of all, the writer uses several personifications for water. Muddy water laps at my dorsal but doesn't enter. This suggests, nice use there, this suggests the negative perspective of the water as it is kicked out of the house. The writer also uses the personification, the perfume river invades the road and climbs the steps of shops and homes. Okay, here there should have been this and that. Note the kinds of things I would point out to you that the examiner it does not seem to be too fussed about here because they're not marking in the way that I would mark your stuff. The use of the strong verb invades, note identification of language, strong verb invades, creates the sense of an enemy approaching slowly. Excellent, here we have analysis. This expresses the writer's contempt with the water, making it seem as the negative character of a story. Strange a strange expression here, okay? But hey, it seems as the negative character of a story. It shows the way the others, the rest of the citizens of Vietnam, are badly affected by the weather and cannot stop the water from entering their homes the way the writer does. So he's juxtaposed the writer's perspective and the others <laughs> as per the question given. Now, you might write something different in your analysis that could be just as valid, but the way that the, this candidate is justifying their responses is logical okay, and based on the evidence given. Secondly, the writer shows the different perspectives on the way other people cope with the rain, suggesting a more positive light. His nephew is described as being unaffected by the extreme weather. He is radiant standing out in the dull weather with his purple rain poncho and yellow motorcycle helmet. The use of the colors contrasting with the rest of the monotonous mood created due to the effect of the routine. Okay, it's a bit of an incomplete sentence there, but it's okay. Not only that, but in the same paragraph, the writer focuses on the sounds by the use of onomatopoeia. Not onomatopoeias, but onomatopoeia. rat -a -tat tatting drumming rain. The excess use of sound, effect, of sound effects standing out from the rest of the text, as well, as well making this specific paragraph more lively and providing a more positive approach. That's a bit vague, but okay. This proves that his nephew's reaction to the rain is different uh, than his seeming unaffected, uh, is different than his seeming unaffected by what would be a depressing weather as he laughs a great belly laugh. Looking at things that stand out in this extract. This is what the candidate is doing. As writer leaves his home, the mood changes as he is no longer in control, leaves his routine, and is now an observer of the way the world is affected by the water. The water is now an, every, uh, is now an enemy, um, which can be seen by the fact that it threatens his genes. However, not everyone sees it that way. Children are described as swimming, shouting, laughing, suggesting their innocence and the way they don't see the weather as threatening as the writer does. A change of perspective answering the question given. There's focus here. 
tourists are suggested to be unaware of the dangers of the weather and as they laugh and curse and squeal the sound effects creating a false sense of cheery mood as they do not have to experience this weather every year like the writer does so there's a deeper thought going on here the candidate is asking why are the tourists responding in this way oh well logically we could deduce that they don't have to deal with it every year so it's kind of fun for them not only that but they snap souvenirs the alliteration and the verb snap creating a negative view of the tourists as they seem to enjoy a helpless little girl's misfortune the one that was stuck on the roof with her dog sorry i'm rushing through this i want to get to the examiner's comment the writer concludes and so now we know the candidate is concluding too the writer concludes the account with a personal thought i wonder if this is the year the water will rise up my walls creating a sense of fear and uncertainty for the future that's what's happening here there's a sense of fear and uncertainty for the future leaving the audience on edge not knowing what will happen the some sort of sense of suspense in other words so this candidate got an a grade all right that's their directed writing response we'll look at that next time let's look at the examiner's comment we've got seven minutes so i'm just going to read through it and then we can discuss it very briefly the candidate immediately demonstrates an understanding of the purpose of the passage and highlights the repetitive use of the phrase in the rainy season they also understand the effect of the writer's language choices in creating the sense of a necessary routine in the struggle against the encroaching water this might also have been a good point to consider the writer's almost fatal okay sorry this might also have been a good point to consider the writer's almost fatalistic tone when discussing these countermeasures who is plainly not convinced that they'll make much difference okay so that's the examiner's opinion excuse me the response then moves to a more detailed focus upon the various personifications of the surrounding waters. The effectiveness of the word invades in giving a malign and determined character to the river is well understood. The candidate's informed grasp of the structure of the passage is also shown by their recognition of the change of tone signaled by the arrival of the radiant nephew who ushers in an acceptance, even an enjoyment of the conditions. The writer's use of onomatopoeic language must have been more fully examined, or it might have been, sorry, might have been more fully examined, but its general effect is well noted. They do mention it. The change in the writer's status from flood victim to an observer of others is a very good point and is well developed in the observation of the children who actually enjoy the flood. The strong understanding of tonal changes, a change in tone, is a feature of the answer, and this is maintained in the final paragraph, which has a clear recognition of the writer's returning anxiety about what next year's rainy season will bring. Okay, and the overall mark that they gave this candidate was 13 out of 15, excuse me, which is very good. It's a bad one. Okay, but point is, it's not 15 out of 15. And I think maybe that's because there were a few lapses in expression, a few funny bits where there was um, not a proper quote incorporation or sentence structure errors. Um, the spelling seemed quite good overall. There might have been one or two. I, I'm not even sure there was anything that stands out to me at the moment. Um, so overall, the examiner liked this. Now, a band one means that as far as the candidate's knowledge and understanding of the passage goes, um, there was perceptive appreciation of content and the ideas in the content. Fluidly relates the content to structure. Look at the, the, um, the repetitive phrases. The audience, the purpose, the genre, the style. Shows keen awareness of intentions of the passage. So show, the candidate shows that they know what the writer is doing or at least are aware of what the writer is trying to do okay so that's where knowledge and understanding of the candidate comes in now that the, the uh, analysis of language effects did the candidate analyze these language effects adequately analyzes text with sensitive and discriminating awareness of how language creates effect i mean the fact that he pointed out the onomatopoeia and how it lightened the mood 
and the juxtaposition of colors, etc. Strong verbs. This candidate is aware of how language works, and that's what your marker wants to see that you that you, that you know. Moves with ease between parts, looking at details, and the whole, the purpose of the whole text, um, in discussing specific examples of language use, and the effect of the whole passage, showing how extreme weather can affect day-to-day -day life in Vietnam. Okay, what else? I want you to know that the candidate is organized. There is a strong structure in your commentary. You move from an introduction, you explore the main or key ideas in the extract. Maybe more could have been done, but in the time limit you're given, you kind of are restricted. And then you conclude. And there's an obvious introduction and conclusion and an analysis. Okay? So there's a strong structure. May be concise. So um, you do, you have to be concise, you're limited to time. Quotation is used fluently. Well, there was a little bit where, you know, um, things had to be more fluent in terms of quote incorporation, but quotes were used to emphasize ideas. The quotes were embedded in the argument, and this links to this fluency. Okay, so um, all of these factors determined that this candidate got a 13 out of 50. Okay, so like I said, it's worthwhile you downloading this uh, candidate response booklet and just read through some of the responses for yourself. Maybe you'd want to see the C grade. They usually show you an A grade, a C grade, and an E grade. So very high, a medium response, and um, a low response. And most students will fall in the middle response range. Most students give a middle, a, mid, a medium type response, okay? But I would like you to try and give grade A responses, all right? Which is why I emphasize things like quote incorporation and silly grammar things, tense, etc. Um, because you need to be aware of that. That is the convention of commentary, and that is the sort of thing you'd be expected to do in your commentary. If you can do it fluidly, your marker will be impressed. Okay. All right, guys, we're at the end of our lesson. Um, thank you for joining me today.